Today's podcast episode was with Ronnie Khan. Now, I don't want to say a lot and ruin this episode for you, but she is probably the most inspiring and passionate person I've ever met in my life. After this conversation, I just felt that she had a crazy power about her because she's the most mission aligned person I've ever heard speak. She's someone that is absolutely oozing with passion for what she does. And every time she talks to someone, she inspires them to think differently about themselves and about what they want to do in life. So I hope this podcast has a similar effect on you and I hope you really enjoy it. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, and welcome back to the Sachin Adam Show. Now, if you notice that I look a little bit different, I actually did in fact shave my head. So let's get that out of the way before we get into our episode. Today, we have the absolute pleasure of talking to Ronnie Khan. Ronnie Khan is one of the most inspirational human beings I've ever come across. She's actually someone who I watched a speech of hers three years ago at Sydney Uni when I was doing something called the Global Citizenship Award. And I'd never heard about her before. And frankly, I hadn't actually heard about her charity, but I'd seen it before. I'd seen some of the cars, some of the vans driving throughout the city. And she was talking about this charity she started called Oz Harvest, which is a food waste charity, which essentially recycles food that would have gone to waste and they give it to hungry souls, hungry people that um, are people in need. And they've gone on to recycle and give over 50 million meals out to people. And after I uh, watched that speech, I actually immediately started volunteering for Oz Harvest because I was so inspired because honestly, what I think they're doing is one of the most impactful things that you can do, not just targeting food waste, but they're feeding hungry souls. And so really, really excited to have a chat today, Ronnie, and talk about your life, your purpose and what you're doing with Oz Harvest. So thanks for coming on. Thank you so much. And I'd like to begin just by acknowledging that my feet are on the ground of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I pay my deep respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all First Nations peoples and to wherever your listeners are hearing this conversation. Thank you, Ronnie. It's an honor to be chatting with you today. And so that was a very impressive introduction and you've done a lot with your time on this earth. Um, but we'd love to start off our episodes by humanizing our guests a little bit. So, you know, 50 million is a big number and your impact is insane. Actually, it's 210 million. I'm not oh, even... Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> we must have seen some very outdated stats. If you'd have said 200, I wouldn't have corrected you, but between 50 and 210, there's a big difference. So no, least, I'm, I'm glad you corrected us. let's get that yeah, right. I th- I think there's a Wikipedia page out there that um, yeah. we've got to edit after this episode. Yeah, let's. Um, I- I'm glad you corrected that early. Um, and it's a massive amount of impact. But we'd love to start off by asking you: Who are you outside your work and your career? Who is Ronnie at her core? You know, Ronnie at her core is the very same person who is Ronnie in the Arts Harvest. I would hope. I've never pretended to be anything other than who I am. I'm a vessel right now for the goodness that I deliver. I don't even know how it happened that I am that person, but I am. And so really, I I don't think I would treat you any differently to treating Barack Obama if he walked through this door because I am just one person. I didn't set out to be a leader. I didn't set out to be... um, an activist. In fact, I say that I'm an accidental activist. I I think I'm just a person who cares deeply and has been given the gift and the ability to make a difference. I think every single one of us has that ability. I am no different from anyone else. I am not unique. I am not special. All I have done is channeled my purpose, and I believe every one of us has a purpose. Some of us don't know it yet, but has a purpose. And that fuels who I am, whether I'm a mother, a grandmother, a partner, a friend. I would hope that I'm just a caring individual who wants to be the best I can be and be present and aware in this very moment. Yeah, that's such a beautiful sentiment. I think that's something we can all aspire to be like. But Ronnie, I'm curious, 
was there any signs that you were going to have this mass impact at a young age? Because you obviously have this infectious personality. Adam spoke about when he heard you speak and you've got this energy to you, but were you like this as a kid? And would, you know, the people that grew up with you think that uh, you would have this kind of career in the future? <laughs> no, you know, I'm not sure if you know, but my memoir came out a short while ago um, and it's called A Repurposed Life, but that's besides the point. And in that, I really had to examine who I was. You know, once I was doing the book, it became really thinking about. And honestly, I was, the, in my mind, I was never going to be anything special. I was never going, I didn't have aspirations to be a leader. I didn't have aspirations to be to be really anything other than a good human being. Um, I was shy and I really only found my voice when I discovered that I had the ability to move food from here to there, making a huge difference to both the planet and to people. And that's when I found my voice. And that's why I think, that's what I think is so important about me sharing my story. For the people who think, oh, she must have been a charity queen or she must have been this when she was a kid. Nothing. I was a spoiled little brat, just like everybody else. I grew up, I grew up into values and I had values that were really embedded in me as a child. And I think that is fundamental because you guys are young and maybe your audience is young. And I think the most important thing is to know that who we are, what we say we are, is, is all very well. It's what we do and it's how we live values. And I didn't even realize I was embedding values that my parents were living, but I subliminally absorbed them. And you are the product of the values that you've absorbed. So as you grow up and as you start thinking about these things, it's important to realize that we all have values embedded in us, but we are also all role models. And that's what's so important. So, you know, a long answer to a short question. No, I didn't have a clue that I'd be this today. <laughs> Uh, Ronnie, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what some of those values are and how your parents instilled them into you, because they sound remarkably important for you. And also, you, you grew up in South Africa, and I know you spent a bit of time in Israel in a commune. Given those quite unique environments, I'm also interested in how that affected you and maybe how those environments and contexts affected your values. Uh, absolutely. But in a way, they were living my values. So you're right. I was born in South Africa, but during the apartheid era. Now, during that era, if you believed in the system, you taught your family and your children that there's a huge difference between people who've got dark skin and light skin. You taught people to hate. You taught people to fear. My parents grew up in that period, but didn't believe in that system. And it was very hard not to not to follow that system because the ramifications were you could go to jail. I mean, it was very harsh, um, embedded apartheid rules. But whilst my parents didn't fight against the system, and some of my friends' parents did, and some of them went to jail, and some of them never got out, and some of them went to Robben Island, my parents didn't fight the system. But what they did was they embedded subliminally values in us and told us and educated us around the values that all people are equal and that we shouldn't discriminate against people. They put me in a school that would have been a challenge for them because we weren't a rich family, but they put me in a private school that was a very liberal thinking. And in South Africa, liberal meant broad-minded and um, leaning to the left, as opposed to what that means in politics here in Australia. And so I didn't know I was absorbing those values, but through the way that they 
taught me. I also went to a youth movement. And in that youth movement, it was very much about socialism, very much about equality and living a life of, of values. So when I left South Africa and went to live on a commune, in a way, that again was just a purely value-led society that had chosen to live inequality according to values. So again, without ever speaking about it, you lived it. You worked, everybody, there was a communal pool of money and it was shared around the needs of the individuals and the community. We never got money. We got like little bingo cards and you could go to the little store and use your play, play money. <laughs> Ronnie, I'm very interested in your parents' psychology at the time. Um, often in these situations where there's systems where people are believing in really horrible value systems, it's very, very difficult, no matter what that value is, to act against it. What do you think was unique about your parents at the time where they were able to stand up to apartheid? So I think I need to make it clear. Um, they didn't, it's not that they stood up to apartheid. They did, <laughs> in, but they didn't go out and do that. You know, they didn't go to protests. They weren't fighting the system. But I think my family are Jewish. The values within the Jewish religion are about respect, about humanity, about caring and sharing. And I think those are embedded values that they got from their parents. Their parents fled Europe because of anti-Semitism. And so I think, I think it definitely, even though we're not religious people, I would say now I'm definitely not, but I am spiritual. I think my parents definitely at that time were very much influenced by their their upbringing, which really was based on, you know, the Jewish religion is based on a value system. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense, Ronnie. And clearly these values are what led to you building Oz Harvest um, all those years later. And I'd love to know, you speak a lot about finding your calling and purpose. And I think a lot of young people listening to this podcast would be, you know, thinking about how they could find their own calling and purpose. So I was wondering how that process came to be for you and, you know, what tips you have for young people trying to find their calling and purpose. Totally. I mean, I think the most important thing. So I think for me, you know, I didn't know I was looking for purpose in that, you know, it's not something now everybody's talking about purpose. I mean, purpose and meaning are just very much part of our lexicon. 20 years ago, what I knew was that I was working, I was fulfilled. But when I came across a problem, and the problem for me was I was running an event company, and every one of my events was producing waste, and I was throwing it away. And you know, for the first years, I threw it away, because that's what you did until one time I did an enormous event and there was just so much food that it actually was unconscionable to throw it away. And so I needed a solution at that moment. And I loaded up my car and actually thought, I've got to give this food away. And I did. And it felt amazing. And that was like a light switch in that often, we have a problem and we often say, why doesn't somebody else solve that problem? But sometimes the somebody is us. In my case, you know, I have no idea why I decided to solve the problem. Other, other event organizers had been throwing away food for years. Every hotel had been throwing away food. Everybody had. But for me, the problem just presented itself both in a way and at a time that I felt, I didn't actually even realize I was solving the problem at the time. What I knew was if I did that and then 
I sort of became a rogue food rescuer until I realized that actually there was more food than I had realized. It wasn't just my problem. And that's really, you know, there were other things that led to me actually deciding to start a charity. But I think another part that's really important for all your young people to listen to and understand, because if you think things are an overnight success, they're not. And I think what's really important to understand is that even once I decided to start Oz Harvest, and I'm going to say something that your people will think is shocking because it will sound like I am seriously old, which I am, but I started Oz Harvest at 50. So you need to know that you don't have to start things at 10 or 12 or 15 or 25, not to give up if you haven't found what it is you were meant to be doing, because I'm a perfect example of finding what it was I am meant to be doing only at 50. But the point I was going to make, not only about when you find that, is that each and every one of us can find our purpose. Sometimes it's in this, the problems we solve, but sometimes it's in the things that we get the most joy of, out of. But what I was going to say was that I had to work another seven years in my business. I didn't start as harvest and immediately say, oh, okay, this is what I'm meant to do. I knew that I loved it, but I still had the reality of needing to earn money and needing to pay mortgage and all those realities. So it was only seven years after having started Oz Harvest that I actually gave up my business and started doing Oz Harvest full time. So I think it's important to understand that sometimes you still have to do other things while you developing the thing that you love, the purpose. Purpose comes from a place of joy and it's in one place, it's in us. The place to find it is not on the supermarket shelf, but is in the mirror when you're looking at yourself and asking the question, what is it that I can do that fills me with joy but adds value to others? And that doesn't mean you have to start a charity. Not at all. Not everybody has to do what I did. Yeah, that's extremely inspirational. Um, and, and we're definitely keen to double click into how you turned the idea and the initial foundations of Oz Harvest into this thriving organization that it is now. But just going back to when you're at the events company, I'm wondering, did you feel like you were living up to your values when you were there as well? Or did you ever feel a sense of you could have been doing more like during that whole tenure at that company that you could have been doing something different for humanity? You know, what I was doing was making a huge difference to the people I was providing and delivering an exquisite event. I always did things at my best. I wanted to create a unique moment in the life of either the individual or the company that I was working with. And so I was very fulfilled because I was making a difference to those people. Now, it didn't matter that it wasn't about money. It wasn't about poor people or it was to those everyone whether it was corporate or whether it was individual I get stopped on the street saying you did my party 35 years ago you did this for my company so I think I've always tried to do whatever I've done to the best that I could but it was only really when I started and developed and and grew as harvest that there was a full alignment between my destiny, between my purpose, between the meaning, and how I could be the most fulfilled person by giving back to society. And the more I give, the more rich I feel. And that's the joy that giving does, because it is more, the more we give, the more we get, actually. A lot more detail. Yeah, I, I, I think am that's just very... sharing, and not because I'm trying to push my book. But, yeah, but it is worth. I think people are using my book as a toolkit. Cool. That's the book. 
repurposed that. <laughs> um, the, it, it, it is a toolkit because it goes through. And, and for me, the purpose of writing the book was again to say, I am not special. Each and all of every one of us has abilities and skills. And when we utilize them and add an element of good to that, that's when you start feeling the best. Um, so Ronnie, you've had this incredible career building Oz Harvest, and now we've kind of got the blueprint about finding your mission and vision, and we're going to put your book in the show notes. Um, but talk us through initially founding Oz Harvest and realizing this is a company that you could scale up and a charity that could actually have mass impact across Australia and across the world. So. I have to correct you because I certainly didn't set it up to create a global empire. <laughs> I set it up because I saw a problem and thought, I'll just fix that problem. It was only a little bit after I'd started that I realized the scale of the problem. I didn't realize that $36 billion worth of food goes to waste every year. I didn't realize then that one in, now it's one in six, one in five Australians needs food. I didn't realize that food waste feeds climate change, that by not wasting food, I was helping to stop climate crisis. I didn't realize any of that. I started because I had food and I thought it should feed people. As we started and as I realized the impact and as people joined and became just enthralled with what it was that we were doing, it sort of fueled and fed everything. And yes, I'm not naive in that it wasn't that I couldn't see and didn't create this movement, but I didn't plan it. So I think that's really important. So it wasn't what I set out to do. I set out just to stop food waste where I saw it. But once it became so apparent that the problem was so huge, and once people, I was like the Pied Piper, people wanted to join because they loved our energy, they loved what we do, they loved wanting to be change makers themselves, because that's what anybody who joins us actually becomes a change maker. Anybody who fights food waste today is a, carb, is a, is a climate activist, because we now know that every time you don't waste food, you're actually stopping climate change. You're, you're stopping methane from going to the atmosphere. So not all of us can drive a Tesla. Not all of us can put solar on our roofs. Not all of us can, you know, go and chain ourselves to, to the gates of foresting and logging, anti-logging. But we can all become activists by not wasting food. So once that realization, that penny dropped, it, it became so obvious. The other thing that both of you will have heard and, and now I realize is a fundamental truth. Somebody in your family, I bet you turned around and said, eat your food because there's someone starving somewhere. It might have been your grandmother. It might have been an aunt or an uncle. And it doesn't matter that you both grew up in different households. That's why I think people love what I do, because somebody's already told them. I didn't have to teach them. They might not have even known the extent of what it meant, but just the notion of wasting food that's costing us water, fuel, energy, labor, becomes, you know, we can relate to that. And so it just grew, you know, we became national because people would call me in other states and say, what can we do? And I'd say, here, let me teach you and we'll bring the model there. And that's really how we've become a global organization because we've taught and shared our model in the UK, in New Zealand, in South Africa, in Japan, and many other countries have, have looked, learnt, and are doing versions. 
Yeah, I, I love all that, Ronnie, and I especially love how this was just a problem to you initially. Then you got an idea, and you were just focusing on it, and then the passion and the sort of tenacity around it, it just grew over time. And I'd love to hear from you before we go into our quick fire questions. Now, looking back on your career with Oz Harvest and growing this to where it is now, what are some of the lessons that you've learned about scaling and running such a large organization with a lot of moving parts and you've got to manage a lot of people? What have you learned about growing an organization? Well, passion's infectious. People listen, believe, and follow a leader that says what they're going to do and does what they say they're going to do. So it is about really being real. I think that growing an organization is about attracting extraordinary people. I say we're a magnet for magnificent people. I shine because of all these extraordinary people around me. It's not about me. It's about all of them. And I think that is when, when you can create a culture and we very, very strong on the culture and understanding why we're there. We, we exist for one reason, and that's to make a difference, to impact people, to feed people, to stop our planet from imploding, literally. It's about people, planet, and community. And though that's the driver, it's, you know. So I think people love the authenticity, the realness, around what it is we stand for and that we do what we say we do. We're very transparent. I love that, making passion so central to your mission. Um, it, it's such an important lesson and it, you're right, it's something that everybody becomes attracted to and wants to join you when you show passion. Um, and now in the interest of time, I would love to talk for much longer. We know that we are in a bit of a time cruncher here. We're going to go into our quick fire round, Ronnie. So basically, this is just sort of wrapping up the episode and bringing it to a sort of personal level again, just to find out a little bit more than you. And we're going to go ahead and ask around seven to eight questions, um, just a little bit about you, and you'll have around 15 to 20 seconds for each one. Are you ready for that? What's one of your favorite books and why? No, only kidding. Um, <laughs> I love um, A Balanced Life, Rohinton Mystery. It's really about people. It's around challenges. It's around struggle. It's around hope. It's exquisitely written. Um, I also love The Diary of Anna Frank because it's just such a meaningful, powerful book around hope. Yeah. And I think hope. What's one of your, hmm. Sorry. What's one of your favorite podcasts and why? So I love Oprah Winfrey. I love Super Soul because she just gets down and dirty and Oprah is very real and no, no nonsense. And I love that she manages to elicit beautiful information from people. What's one of your favorite hobbies outside of work? So I've recently taken up swimming again and I love it. Beautiful. You go, Seth. Um, yeah, Ronnie, what's a life principle that you live by? Mm. Do what you say, say what you do. I love that. That's a good one. Um, what's a habit that you do every day that sets you up for the day? I'm filled with gratitude. Every morning I wake up and I touch my bed and I think how lucky am I to live in a bed, to sleep in a bed. And I look at the ceiling and think how grateful am I that there's a roof above my head. And I look out the window and say thank you because I have a window. So I think gratitude, awareness around gratitude is something that I'm constantly drawing on. That's beautiful. I think that really shines through with your personality. And so, Ronnie, this has been a fantastic episode. And as Adam said, we'd love to talk to you for hours, but we'd love to finish off our podcast by asking our guests, if there's one thing you want to leave our audience with, who if we like to think future leaders of Australia, the world, what would that be? Well, I like to believe that they are, and I'm thrilled that you asked me because I think every single person is listening with you, to this podcast. I want you to know that you are immensely powerful 
that your actions make a difference. Every single one of you. There's this beautiful story in my book. If I've got a moment, I can share it with you. And it goes like this. It's the afterword of the book, but I think it's really important. And I'll do it very quickly. So it goes like this. It's a quote based on an author. Um, you can find the details, but I like to give credit to Amos Oz where I heard this. In the event of a huge conflagration like a fire, each and every one of us has three options as to what we can do. You can look at that fire, number one. You can look at that fire and run away as fast as you can and leave those people that cannot run to burn. It's an option. Number two, you can write an angry letter to the newspaper demanding that the people who started the fire get punished. Or number three, you can run and find a bucket. And if you cannot find a bucket, you find a jug. And if you cannot find a jug, you find a teaspoon. And a teaspoon is tiny, I know, and the fire is huge. But there are millions of us, and every single one of us has a teaspoon. So I want to invite all of your listeners to join the Order of the Teaspoon, where we wear a teaspoon on our shoulder or in our ear or on our <laughs> ring, They're available on my website, so that we remind it that we all have a teaspoon and we all have the ability to make a difference, large or small. And that is the overriding message that I want every single person to listen to. It's not about your age. It's not about your fortune. It's not about where you are in society. It's about doing and making a difference to someone. Random acts of kindness every single day. Wow. That is the most amazing way to finish up a podcast episode. Your passion and inspiration just oozing through the screen, Ronnie. Thank you so much for all of that. Thank you so much.